You know, we have always wanted to have like everybody over to our house. We have. And so uh, here we are. And uh, we decided to film uh, the Easter sermon here at our place. So uh, I'm going to head uh, down there to the uh, family room and teach. You go for it. And you, by the way, you look, you look great today. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, it has uh, got to seem like this is a really strange Easter. I mean, some of you are just probably going, this feels, this feels nothing uh, like Easter should feel like. Certainly not a normal Easter. Uh, usually on Easter weekend, you've got like uh, millions of people in their cars going to church buildings. And this weekend, you have uh, millions of people huddled in uh, living rooms and family rooms watching online services. And uh, a normal Easter usually feels kind of light. I mean, uh, Easter clothes and uh, maybe uh, Easter egg hunts. And this season, this Easter just feels uh, really, really heavy. I mean, the, the coronavirus is dominating the news and it's dominating uh, much of our lives. So some of you go, yeah, it just doesn't feel like Easter at all. And often this time of year, people are thinking about their plans. Uh, many of you would have been returning from spring break this weekend or uh, plans for graduation, graduation open houses, plans for an upcoming vacation, plans for a trip, plans for a May wedding. And it feels like right now, you know, all those plans, so many of them have been uh, upended. And so the sense is just, you know, this doesn't feel like Easter at all. But perhaps this Easter... This uh, 2020 coronavirus lockdown Easter, it might just feel closer to the first Easter than any Easter we ever experienced. Because uh, the first Easter Sunday morning was on the heels of the devastating uh, crucifixion of Jesus. And the disciples, I mean, you talk about heaviness uh, and I do get to advance my own slides today. Uh, heaviness, uh, I don't think things could have been any heavier. And uh, that Easter Sunday morning when the disciples wake up, uh, the scripture tells us that they were huddled in a room for fear of going outside, that they too would be arrested and perhaps killed. And after traveling Je with Jesus for three years, uh, all of their plans and hopes had been upended. And so there is a possibility that this Easter might bring you in contact with the emotions of that first Easter more than any that you've ever experienced. And, and already I know what some of you are thinking here. You're thinking, yeah, yeah, Jeff, but uh, there, was the, there was the empty tomb. There's the, you know, hallelujah, he is risen and their sorrow was turned to joy. Y yeah, uh, uh, about that empty tomb. When the women first went to the tomb and found that Jesus' body was gone, this did not lead to immediate joy. It just intensified the level of confusion that everybody was feeling. Listen, they didn't see the resurrection coming. Uh, Mary Magdalene, one of Jesus' close friends, she is uh, at the tomb. The body's missing. She is having an absolute meltdown. She's weeping, sobbing. Jesus stands near her. She says, woman, why are you crying? Uh, Mary's response is this, sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you put him and I will get him. Uh, Mary, his dear friend, Mary Magdalene, she doesn't see this coming the resurrection, Jesus fully alive after being fully dead. And you go, yeah, well, it makes sense that Mary Magdalene didn't see this coming. I mean, after all, she probably hasn't slept in a couple days. She's emotionally distraught. She's probably still in shock. But the disciples, I mean, the dudes, the guys that had traveled with Jesus for three years, certainly they saw this coming. Women run from the empty tomb. They find the disciples behind locked doors in a house. And this is what the, happens with the disciples. It says, but they, the disciples, they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. It's like, what? 
And what appeared to you and said that he's risen? Uh, no, no, the, the disciples, they didn't see this coming. In fact, uh, I believe that there is only one person in Jesus' inner circle that actually saw this coming. So who was that? Maybe one of his uh, inner circle disciples, maybe someone like Peter. Well, Peter, he runs to the tomb. He looks inside. He sees that it's empty. Uh, bending over, he saw the strips of linen by themselves, and he went away wondering to himself, what has just happened? What in the world is going on here? You see, Mary Magdalene didn't see it coming, and the disciples didn't see it coming, and even the inner ring disciples like Peter, Peter didn't see it coming. So who was that one person in Jesus' inner circle that actually saw this coming? And the answer is, Jesus saw this coming. I want you to see some words that is possible that you've heard read before on Easter weekends at church. It is the angel at the tomb speaking to the women. I want you to see the last four words very carefully. He is not here. He has risen. And then the last four words, just as he said. See, Jesus had talked about his coming crucifixion, and Jesus had also talked about his coming resurrection. Disciples didn't even have a category for this, that their Messiah, the one they hoped to be a king, would go and get himself killed. And so they couldn't figure out how to deal with what was Jesus was saying about his coming crucifixion and the coming resurrection. But that just that statement there, he is not here, he is risen just as he said, Jesus saw it coming which is a powerful thing. I love this uh, painting by the uh, Italian artist uh, Caravaggio. It is, uh, what the picture is depicting is uh, Jesus meeting with two disciples following the resurrection, and there's a server in the background, and these disciples are called the Emmaus disciples. And I want you to lock in on this picture. Because when Jesus rises from the dead, this he was dead and now is alive, it's just, it wasn't just a ghost, uh, floaty figure, uh, mirage, uh, vision, or it seemed to them like he was still kind of with them in their hearts. He was physically present, and there are a couple instances, three that I count, when he ate with his disciples. There's even a beautiful story where Jesus makes a campfire and cooks breakfast for his disciples. What I'm saying is this, is that Jesus was fully alive. He had been fully dead and is now fully alive, fully restored, fully, fully restored, fully renewed, fully alive. And Jesus saw this coming. As Jesus is carrying his cross to the place where he will be killed, Jesus saw this coming. And what this means is that Jesus knew that what was about to transpire would include pain, but it wouldn't end in pain. The fact that Jesus saw this coming, he knew that it would include abandonment, but it would end in reunion. It would include intense pain, but it would end with intense joy. It would include death but it would end in life. Okay, okay, so Jesus saw his resurrection coming. What in the world does that have to do with us who are on a lockdown over Easter and are really kinda maybe worried about what the next months are gonna hold and when things are gonna get back to normal, what does the fact that Jesus saw his resurrection coming, what does that have to do with people who feel like their lives are on hold, uh, people who are in a season of, uh, I would just say, deep sadness, and others who feel totally overwhelmed? Let's talk about it. Shortly, shortly after the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, the story of this once dead, then alive, 
savior would begin to spread throughout the major cities of the Roman Empire, uh, places like Philippi, places like Thessalonica, and places like Corinth. Now, I discovered something. I discovered something recently that I don't think I'd ever read before or seen before, and it is this that the letters that were written to these churches, uh, in your Bible, the letter to the Philippians, uh, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and 1st and 2nd Corinthians, when the letters were written to those believers, those early believers, the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned again and again and again. But this is what I hadn't seen before. Almost every single time the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned, it is linked in the letters to the resurrection of the believer. Almost every single time the story looks back and recalls how Jesus was dead and came to life, that is linked to the story that moves forward to the end of time where believers in Jesus who have been forgiven because of his crucifixion and called to new life because of his resurrection, that they would be fully restored, fully renewed, and fully alive. And what that allowed, knowing that they would be fully alive later, empowered them to be fully alive now even when they were on hold, and even when they were in deep sadness, and even when they felt totally overwhelmed. Almost every time in the letters that the, that the resurrection of Jesus is mentioned, it is linked to your resurrection. And so, I just want you to travel with me. I want you to travel with me to Philippi. In a traveling to Philippi, let's just talk about what it's like to be on hold. When Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians, <laughs> he was under house arrest. He was awaiting trial that was going to come up somewhere in the future, and his entire life was on hold. Under house arrest, he was not able to travel. He was not able to visit churches and encourage them. Paul, his whole life is on hold when he writes to the Philippians. Uh, maybe you've had the experience recently. You call uh, some company and on comes a recording, we're sorry, but our operators are assisting other customers. Your call is important to us. Please stay on the line and we will be with you when our earliest representative is available. This call may be recorded for quality purposes and then you wait and you wait and you wait. But for how long? I mean, 30 seconds, three minutes, 30 minutes? I mean, uh, maybe there's time while you're waiting to take your phone with you. Maybe there's time to run down to the basement. <laughs> maybe there's time to run a marathon. Maybe you can set your phone on the countertop because as you're on hold, maybe there's time to write a couple emails and maybe there's time to write a novel. And then, and then as the beautiful elevator music plays, the recording comes back. Your call is important to us. We're sorry, our operators are meeting with other customers. And in your mind, you're imagining this call center that is absolutely stocked with a group of operators eager to take your problem. And maybe it is, and maybe it's not. Maybe all of our operators are, are uh, unavailable. Maybe that just means Floyd. And, and he's in the break room during his lunch break eating some microwave pizza and reading a comic book, and he is in no hurry at all to listen to your problem or to the problems of the 137 people in front of you. Uh, have you ever been on hold? And I wonder uh, how many of you feel uh, that your life is kind of on hold right now in some areas. Uh, you're on hold waiting waiting to find out when and how graduation is gonna happen this spring. The, the, the 20th uh, anniversary trip that you were going to take, uh, what, in late May, early June? Uh, right now, that's on hold. 
Some of you were ready to search for a house to buy or plant a sign in your front yard to sell a house. And right now, as everybody is kind of like this uh, stay-at-home order, yeah, that's on hold. And maybe you were just about to take another job. Uh, you had gone through the third interview. Now you were talking, what are the you know, benefits? What are the hourly rate? Or what is the salary? And then all of a sudden, the lockdown and many companies are having massive furloughs or layoffs. Now, you're aware of something right now. They are not in the process of hiring people just to immediately furlough them. And so that job transition is now on hold. The Apostle Paul, his whole life was on hold under house arrest when he writes to the Philippians. And then he does it. And he talks about the resurrection of Jesus. And he not only talked about how Jesus was dead and then alive, but he also links the resurrection of Jesus to his resurrection in the future, the resurrection of the believer and the resurrection of the Philippians who had trusted in their Lord. We find this in uh, chapter three where Paul goes, uh, the Lord Jesus, and then he says, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like, it's interesting, so that they will be like his glorious body. See, his glorious body, what it's talking about there is the resurrected body of Jesus, fully restored, fully renewed, fully alive. And he said, there's friends, there's going to come a day, there's going to come a day, there's going to come a day. This is our ultimate hope. There is going to come a day where he will transform our lowly, fragile, broken, aging, discouraged bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. There it is. The connection between the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of the believer. Listen to me. I need you to see this coming. Jesus saw his resurrection coming. It gave him patience. It gave him courage as he carried his cross. I need you to see your resurrection coming. Know that there is a day of total restoration, of full renewal, fully alive. Know that someday you will be fully alive, and I believe that this will help you and sustain you to be fully alive now. Knowing that you will be fully alive then will help you live the best life you've ever lived now. When we see our resurrection coming, it helps us respond with patience and courage, my friends, when we find ourselves on hold. Travel with me down the road, a little bit uh, to the west, from uh, Philippi to Thessalonica. It's, It's about 100 miles. They're experiencing something much deeper and more tragic and heavier than simply being on hold. Believers in Thessalonica, they're experiencing some deep sadness. Paul travels to the city of Thessalonica. He establishes a Jesus community in the city of Thessalonica, and he leaves Thessalonica. And then he begins to hear word that uh, many of the Jesus followers there, many of the believers there, had died, had passed away. And so in his letter, 1 Thessalonians, He's got to talk about deep loss. You see, this this is one of the times when we are more apt to think about the world to come. And not when everything's going well, but in that moment when hospice is called him for a loved one. Or when you find yourself walking through the parking lot of a funeral home to stand with a friend. When you show up at a church and you're sitting a few rows behind the grieving family. Or when you uh, stand in a cemetery and you say goodbye for the last time. And then someone off to the side mutters, I know we'll see her again. Now, this is either naive blather 
or the best news in the world to which we hang our hope. And Paul is writing to these grieving people in Thessalonica. Some of their friends had died, had passed away, and immediately he takes them, not simply to Jesus' resurrection, but to their own resurrection when they will meet their friends who will be fully restored, fully renewed, and fully alive. Listen to the way he does it. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have, and look at the expression he uses here, fallen asleep in him. He's talking about here about their friends who have passed away. It's like he says, listen, they have fallen asleep, but there will come a day at the end of time when our Lord will awaken those who are connected to him, those who have fallen asleep in him. But notice the link again, this connection between Jesus, was dead, then alive, and the believer, once dead, then alive in the resurrection at the end of time. We believe that Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that Jesus, our Lord, that he died and came back, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep. In him, and the time when our heart might be drawn to this more than any other are those times in our lives where we actually have to think about the potential passing of someone that we love dearly. Uh, I have a, a dear friend uh, by the name of uh, Phil, and uh, his wife is suffering from a terrible, debilitating illness. It's called ALS. And when you get an ALS diagnosis, you know that this has the potential of radically reducing your lifespan. As all the co coronavirus stuff was first bubbling up, uh, Phil reached out to me. We we're talking over the phone. Now understand, he and his wife, they have to think about the next world constantly because of the nature of the disease that they're facing. And Phil said to me, he said, Jeff, I almost feel sorry for people who've never had to wrestle this down. <laughs> Here they are with their lives disrupted and the fear of what happens if this illness sweeps faster and harder. How many lives will it take? He says, we had to wrestle this down a long time ago. And to begin to shift their focus to the life that comes after death, the, the resurrection of the body. Some years ago, uh, I've done this more than a few times, and I probably ought to do it three or four times a year, and just helping clarify our vision of the future. Because for many of us, life after death is its just so boring and utterly unenticing. And this is what's done it to us. I mean, just the cartoons that portray heaven. And usually it's only one color. It's, it's, it's white and there are these floaty clouds and just people are sitting there with wings. I don't know about you, but if that's your image of heaven in the future, if that's your, I mean, does this compel you and call you forward? And in that sermon, some years back, it was an Easter sermon, I think around uh, 2016, I talked about the world that we experience now. Now listen, the world that we live in now is beautiful, and yet it's broken. But that beauty part of it, we have lakes, we have trees, we have hiking, we have kayaking, we have boating, we have mountain biking. We've got this transcendent beauty where someone can walk out on a beautiful spring day and begin to plant in a garden. And the question I've asked over the years is this, why would our vision of the future be more pathetic than the creation we see around us now. My friends, God has in store for us a renewed, restored creation. It is the ability to be with our resurrected Lord in a resurrected planet, in a resurrected body. So a uh, week and a half ago, I guess it was, I uh, went over to Phil's driveway. We were gonna take a bike ride together. And I asked him, I said, uh, 
Do you remember that sermon that I did a few years back? I was, I was talking about this one. And he said, yeah, we may have listened to that two or three times that year, and we may have listened to that five times since then. Why? My friends, why? Because knowing, remembering, seeing that that resurrection is coming, knowing that I will be fully alive then helps me to be fully alive now and to face my present with patience and with courage. Knowing that I will be fully alive then helps me live my best life now. Now, I, I think you've got where, where this is going and you probably have an, enough, right? Uh, in the letters, uh, Jesus' resurrection is almost always linked to the resurrection of the believer. He saw his resurrection coming. You should see your resurrection coming. This, this can be unbelievably helpful when we find ourselves on hold, when we find ourselves in deep loss. But, but just to seal this in our minds and to seal this in our hearts, let me take you to one final place and one final challenge knowing of the resurrection that is to come helps to sustain us when we feel totally overwhelmed. The third location is here, Corinth. And uh, in 2 Corinthians, uh, where the Apostle Paul is writing to Corinthian believers, Corinthian followers of Jesus. He talked about his own circumstances. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, you would hear uh, Paul saying, listen, we want you to know about the extreme situation we've been under. And he says, basically, we were crushed and overwhelmed. We were crushed and we were overwhelmed. Even as I say that word, overwhelmed, and even as you look at this image of someone weighed down by a load that they simply cannot carry, I, I just wonder how many of you feel overwhelmed today, or at least in this season, Often, it's not because we're overwhelmed by a thing. <laughs> Often we overwhelm because it's one thing after another. First there's that thing, then there's this thing, then there's that thing, and these conspire. It's not the individual things, it's, it's the sum that begin to overwhelm us. Uh, some of you are going stir crazy in a house and you are dying for more physical interaction with other people. And then one thing after, in addition to that, maybe there's some financial worries, financial concerns. When will we get called back to work? Will we get called back to work? And then maybe you experience uh, just a disappointment in a friendship. I mean, just Someone says something stupid, someone lets you down, and suddenly you find yourself overwhelmed and weighed down. You, you can actually feel achy, as if something is radically wrong that is supposed to be radically right. This is where Paul is when he's writing to these people. He says, I, I just need you to know what's been going on with us. We were crushed and overwhelmed. Just normal, you know, buck up determination wasn't going to cut it. And then Paul would drop this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, down around verse 8 or 9. He would say, but this happened so that we would not rely on ourselves. This happened so that we might rely on God who raises the dead. And just a couple pages later, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
Here it is again, a link between the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of the believer. Follow this one last time where he just says, we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus. Paul says, this is my hope. This is my hope right here. Uh, we know that the one who raised Jesus back to life will also raise us to life with Jesus, fully renewed, fully restored, fully alive. And from Paul's perspective, knowing that he would be fully alive then helped him be fully alive. Now, right after that in 2 Corinthians 4 is where Paul called, you remember that thing, crushed and overwhelmed? He goes on to say, our light and momentary troubles. In light of the resurrection, our light and momentary troubles. Jesus saw his resurrection coming. Jesus knew, he knew as he carried his cross, that abandonment would be replaced by reunion, that extreme pain would be replaced by extreme joy, that extreme ridicule would be uh, replaced by extreme honor, that, that life would be replaced by death. He saw his resurrection coming. And my challenge to you is this. See your resurrection coming, knowing that there will be a day fully restored, fully renewed, fully alive, will help sustain you when you feel like life is on hold. If you pass through a season when you're engulfed in deep sadness, or when you feel totally overwhelmed. We have to comprehend that what God has predicted and promised for us here is our ultimate hope. Now, we have an immediate hope, and our immediate hope is that things will get back to normal. I just want life out there in a month or two to be like it was in February. I want it to be normal like it was before. I want it to get back to normal. And listen, I want that for you too. And I hope, I hope that you're able to reschedule the vacation that is currently on hold. I, I, I hope that you are able to graduate with celebration and ceremony. I hope that the finances that have taken a hit, I hope that those recover and I hope that you get back to work. But just remember something with me. The way it was before, back to normal, that was broken. I mean, as some of you say, I want things to get back to normal, you might be saying, we need to get back to marriage counseling. <laughs> we want to get things back to normal. I want to get back to work, but that will take you back to the stress of work. I want to get things back to normal, meaning you will reschedule your hip replacement surgery. Listen, my friends, what might happen with back to normal is simply exchanging this stress for that stress. The hope of the resurrection promises so much more. The hope of the resurrection promises a day when God will make all broken things right. And it comes from the voice of the resurrected Lord, who is our prototype for resurrection, who would say, I am making everything new. See it coming, see it coming, see it coming. Because knowing that you will have full life in the future, can guide you into be fully alive now. Knowing that you will be fully alive then will empower you with courage and patience 
to be fully alive now. And so I ask that our gracious God will bless you this Easter weekend, that you will remember what he did, that you will remember who you are, and that you would be able to see where you are going.